Monica was the son of Mishoni village, and everyone knew it. Her beauty wasn't just skin deep. It was woven into the way she moved, the way she spoke, the way she breathed life into everything around her. Her skin, a warm golden hue, caught the light of the morning sun as if the gods themselves had kissed her at birth. Her afro, short and kinky, framed her face like a crown, a testament to her natural, untamed beauty. And her body, voluptuous, curvaceous, was a reflection of the fertile African earth, full of life and promise. Men couldn't help but stare when she passed by, whether she was carrying water from the river or balancing firewood on her head. Their eyes followed her every movement, spellbound as if she were a goddess walking among mortals. But behind the glow of her skin and the sway of her hips was a life of hardship. Monica lived with her older brother Onyi and their mother in a small crumbling hut at the edge of the village. Their father had died years ago and since then, the family had been struggling to survive. Every day was a battle to make ends meet. Onyi had stepped into the role of the man of the house, but his role wasn't just as a protector. It was as the enforcer, the muscle. Onyi stood six feet tall, his body hardened from years of labor and fight. His reputation as the village bully was legendary. He was feared, respected, and never crossed. But for all his strength and rage, his love for Monica was unmatched. She was his sister, his blood, and he would tear down mountains to keep her safe. Mishoni village rested on the coastline of Olokoyot, the sea stretching out before them vast and untamable. Beyond the crashing waves and jagged rocks lay Mishoni Island, a small, ragged place shrouded in mystery. It was here that Monica had found love. Kamash, a fisherman from the island, had caught her eye during one of the village's trading days. He was not like the other men who swooned over her. Kamash was different, lean, wary, with a wild, untamed beard that gave him a look of danger. His dark eyes burned with passion and mischief, and Monica had been drawn to him like a moth to flame. Their love had been a wild wind. Every stolen moment, every shared glance felt electric. Monica had never known passion like this before. When they were together, the rest of the world faded away. Their bodies, their hearts, their very souls were in perfect sync. They couldn't keep their hands off each other, even in public, which scandalized the villagers. But Monica didn't care. She was in love, and Kamash was everything she had ever wanted. As Kamash's birthday approached, Monica knew she had to give him something special. She had been saving for months, working harder than ever, selling whatever she could to gather enough money. And finally, she had bought him the perfect gift, a wineskin made from the hide of an African lion. It was no ordinary wineskin. It was a symbol of strength, power, and love. It was as if she were giving Kamash a part of herself, something rare, something fierce. On the morning of Kamash's birthday, Monica dressed in her finest outfit. Her skirt, made from the softest cowhide, clung to her hips, barely covering her thighs. Her top, a thin strip of cloth, crossed her chest but left little to the imagination. She knew she looked stunning. She wanted Kamash's breath to catch in his throat when he saw her. She wanted him to feel the same wild, uncontrollable desire she felt every time she laid eyes on him. But as she reached the show, her heart sank. She had spent every last coin to the wineskin and had forgotten to save enough for the boat ride to Vishoni. The sea stretched out before her, mocking her with its vastness. 
How could she have been so foolish? How could she have forgotten something so important? Panic gripped her as she paced along the shore, her mind racing for a solution. Then she thought of Tracy, her childhood friend. Tracy came from a wealthy family, and Monica was sure she could borrow the fare from her. She rushed to Tracy's home, her heart pounding. Tracy greeted her with a smile, but as soon as Monica explained her situation, the smile faded. I am sorry, Monica, Tracy said, her voice dripping with false sympathy. Things are tight for us right now. I really wish I could help, but... She trailed off, her eyes cold. Monica's stomach twisted with the sting of betrayal. She knew Tracy could afford to help her. This wasn't about money, it was about jealousy. Tracy had always been envious of the attention Monica received. And now, when Monica needed her the most, she was turning her back. Desperate and defeated, Monica returned to the show, her dreams of seeing Kamash slipping away. She sat by the water, staring out at the waves, her heart heavy with disappointment. That's when Jinga approached. Jinga the boatman was an older man, rough around the ages, with a reputation for being a bit of a lecher. He had ferried villagers to and from Vishoni for years, and he knew everyone's business. He could see the sadness in Monica's eyes, the desperation in her posture. Beautiful Monica, why so sad? He asked, his voice thick with false concern. Monica hesitated, but then, seeing no other option, she told him her predicament. Jinga listened, his eyes gleaming with an idea. I will take you to Vishoni, but it will not be for free. Monica felt a chill run down her spine. She knew what was coming before he even said it. What do you want? She asked, her voice barely a whisper. Jinga's eyes traveled over her body, lingering on her exposed skin. You know what I want, Monica, he said. A grin spreading across his face. Your body. One night with you and I'll take you to your lover. Monica's heart pounded in her chest. She felt sick, disgusted. But what choice did she have? She couldn't let Kamash down. She couldn't miss his birthday. With tears stinging her eyes, she nodded. Fine, she whispered, her voice trembling. I'll do it. The boat ride to Vishoni was silent. Monica sat in the back of the boat, her stomach churning, her mind racing. Jinga rowed steadily, his eyes flicking back to her every now and then, his grin never fading. When they reached the island, Jinga led her into the dense forest that bordered the shore. There, hidden from view, Monica paid her price. When it was over, she felt hollow, ashamed. But she pushed the feelings down, forced them into the deepest parts of her soul. She couldn't afford to think about it now. She had to see Kamash. She had to remind herself why she had done this. As she stepped out of the forest and onto the path leading to Kamash's village, she spotted him in the distance. His tall, lean figure stood against the horizon, his dark eyes scanning the sea. When he saw her, his face lit up with a smile that made her heart skip a bit. For a moment, all the shame, all the disgust melted away. She ran to him, her arms outstretched, her heart full. She leaped into his arms, wrapping her legs around his waist, kissing him passionately. But Kamash, though happy to see her, sensed something was wrong. As they walked back to his home, he asked how she had managed to get the money from the boat ride. Monica's heart raced. She tried to avoid the question, brushing it off with vague answers. But Kamash was persistent. His suspicion grew with every evasive response. Finally, he stopped, turned to her, 
and demanded the truth. Monica's heart pounded in her chest. She looked into Kamash's eyes, her guilt weighing heavy on her shoulders. She couldn't keep it any longer. She told him everything. The boat ride. The price she had paid. Jinga's disgusting hands on her body. Kamash's face twisted with rage. His hands clenched into fists. His body trembling. You slept with Jinga? Two. He spat. His voice filled with venom. Jinga? He shoved her away. Disgusted, furious. How could you, Monica? How could you do this to me? Monica's heart shattered into a million pieces. She reached for him, tears streaming down her face. But he stepped back, his eyes cold. You are not the woman I thought you are, he said, his voice dripping with contempt. Go back to Mishoni. I don't want to see you again. The heavens opened and rain poured down, drenching them both as Kamash turned and walked away, leaving Monica standing alone, broken and defeated. She collapsed to the ground, the weight of her choices pressing down on her like a stone. She had lost everything, her dignity, her pride, and now her love. With no money left and no way to get back to the mainland, Monica was forced to trade the lion hide wineskin, the precious gift she had bought for Kamash, for a ride home. When she finally reached Mishoni, she was a shell of the woman who had left. Her brother Onyi noticed the change in her immediately. He demanded to know what had happened and through sobs, Monica drenched and broken fell into her brother's arms, her body trembling with the weight of everything she had been through. Onyi's eyes darkened as she recounted her tale, every word driving a dagger deeper into his heart. His little sister, the one person in the world he swore to protect, had been humiliated, violated, and betrayed. Onyi's blood boiled, as she told him about Jinga's vile offer and Kamash's cruel rejection. His fist clenched so tightly that his knuckles turned white. He could barely contain the rage surging through him. You did what you had to do for love. Monica sobbed. But it was all for nothing. Her words only fueled the fire in Onyi's heart. He wasn't just angry. He was enraged. And the only thing that could quench that fury was vengeance. That night, as Monica cried herself to sleep, Onyi sat outside their small home, sharpening his machete, his mind consumed with thoughts of blood and retribution. He had never liked Kamash, and now he had the reason to make him pay for every tear Monica had shed. He didn't care about the consequences. He didn't care about the law. The only thing that mattered now was his sister's honor. At the break of dawn, without a word to his mother or Monica, Onyi set out for Vishoni Island. His large muscular frame moved with purpose through the misty morning air. The sun had barely risen when he arrived at the shore, but he didn't hesitate. He paid Jinga, who had no idea what was coming and crossed the sea his mind fixed on one goal, Kamash. The island was quiet when Onyi arrived. The villagers of Vishoni were still asleep, unaware of the storm that had just landed on their shores. Onyi moved quickly, his eyes scanning their hearts until he found Kamash's small home at the edge of the village. Without knocking, without a second thought, Onyi kicked the door open. Kamash startled from his sleep, Barely had time to react before Onyi was on him. What the hell? Kamash started, but his words were cut off as Onyi's fist collided with his face. The blow sent Kamash crashing into the wall, blood spurting from his nose. Onyi didn't stop. His anger, frustration, all the pent-up rage exploded as he rained blows down on Kamash, who had no chance to defend himself. 
You think you can humiliate my sister and get away with it? Onyi growled, his voice like thunder. You think you can throw her around like she means nothing? Kamash now bloodied and barely conscious, tried to crawl away, but Onyi grabbed him by the collar and slammed him against the wall. She gave everything for you. Onyi roared. And you repaid her with betrayal. Onyi raised his machete, the blade gleaming in the early morning light. For a moment, the world seemed to hold its breath. Kamash's eyes widened with terror. But before Onyi could bring the blade down, something inside him shifted. Killing Kamash would be too easy. Death was too quick, too merciful. Instead, Onyi swung the machete low, slicing through Kamash's knee with brutal precision. Kamash let out a scream that echoed through the village as he collapsed to the floor, clutching his ruined leg. Onyi stood over him, breathing heavily, his chest rising and falling with the weight of his rage. You will never walk again. Onyi's part. You will spend the rest of your life crawling just like you made my sister feel. With that, Onyi turned and walked out of the house, leaving Kamash writhing in agony on the floor. The villagers, now awake and gathering outside, looked on in, stunned silence as Onyi made his way back to the show, his mission complete. By the time Onyi returned to Mishoni, word of his act of vengeance had already spread. The village was buzzing with whispers of what he had done. Some admired him for defending his sister's honor. Others feared him, knowing that no one was safe from his wrath. But Onyi didn't care about the rumors. He only cared that Monica's pain had been avenged. When he walked into their home, Monica looked up at him, her eyes still red and swollen from crying. She could see the blood on his hands, the wide look in his eyes, and she knew what he had done. Onyi, she whispered, her voice trembling. What have you done? I did what had to be done. Onyi said, his voice steady. He won't hurt you again. But the victory was hollow. Monica's heart was still broken, and now her brother was a marked man. Kamasha's family wouldn't let this go unpunished, and it was only a matter of time before the authorities came looking for Onyi. Days passed, and the weight of what had happened began to settle over the family. Monica, though grateful for her brother's protection, couldn't shake the guilt. She knew that Onyi had risked everything for her, and now he was in danger because of her choices. The once vibrant light in her eyes had dimmed, and she spent her days in silence. The laughter that had once filled their home now replaced by a heavy, oppressive quiet. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting the village in the shades of gold and shadow, Onyi came to Monica's side. He knelt down in front of her, his face soft, the hardness in his eyes replaced by something else, something more vulnerable. I have to go, he said quietly. Monica looked at him, her heart sinking. She had known this moment was coming, but hearing the words out loud made it real. Where will you go? She asked her voice barely a whisper. I don't know. Onyi admitted. But I can't stay here. They'll come for me. And if I'm here, they'll come for you and Mama too. Monica's eyes filled with tears. I don't want you to go. I'll be back one day. He promised. But for now, you have to stay strong. You and Mama will make it through this. We always do. Monica nodded, tears streaming down her face. She hugged him tightly, feeling the warmth of his body, knowing it might be the last time she ever felt his arms around her. Before dawn, Onyi slipped away into the night, leaving behind everything he had ever known. Monica watched from the doorway as his figure disappeared into the distance, her heart heavy with loss. Mishoni village carried on, as villagers do, but the scars of the fateful day never fully healed. Monica, 
though no longer the carefree girl she once was, learned to live with the pain. She found strength in her mother, in the quiet resilience of their daily lives. But every day, she looks towards the horizon, waiting for the day her brother would return. And though the sea was vast and the distance great, Monica knew deep down that Onyi would always be out there, somewhere fighting for her, just as he always had. One can't help but wonder. Monica wanted to see Kamash, but at what cost? Why risk a once perfect relationship? Could there possibly have been a better alternative? Oni takes out all of his anger on Kamash rather than the perpetrator of the unspeakable crime. To what gain? Had Tracy taken a different stance and actually helped Monica, things would have turned out differently. Could she have been the key? An endless array of questions of what might or could have been. But such is the unpredictable nature of fate. Hide or run from it, there is no escape. Monica's fate was sealed the moment she fell in love with Kamash. Or was it?